There we go. There we go. Can you guys hear me okay? Everyone here? Am I loud enough for everyone? Certainly hope so. I think um, every once in a while, I'm not sure how this happens, but in between ZBrush, uh, OBS, OBS streamed out to Facebook and a few other places. Sometimes uh, settings get turned back off. I think I updated some OBS stuff, but uh, sorry about that. I think I should have it in line now. But uh, let me know in the chat if you guys can all hear me, and then we'll, we'll get going. So, as I mentioned last uh, stream around, I believe that was week before last, um, I was making some IMM brushes. Sweet. You guys can hear me. Awesome. Uh, again, this is Tony Leonard for, sitting in on uh, ZBrush Live for Pixelogic, and... Uh, my usual mandate is doing some ZBrush for illustration work, so I'm going to do a little bit of that, but uh, today I'm going to probably try to create something new uh, based off of some of the tools that we built last time. Uh, took the last week, week and a half uh, or so, and built some new tools uh, to use as far as like IMMs, can, um, using the same methods that I was doing in the last stream, and I know it was kind of maybe possibly a little bit hard to follow, especially if you're new to Fusion 360 uh, and or if you're new to ZBrush, but um, I'm trying to come up with a workflow that, uh, oh, oh, cool. Are you the only one with a black screen? Uh, is there a black screen? It looks like on my end there should be a full screen, but uh, let me know if everything's streaming out okay. I'm actually going to check. Yep, looks like uh, on Twitch I should be all right. All right, so let's get it rolling. Cool. All right, so on to ZBrushing. So I made a few brushes um, that I'm gonna about to release for you guys. Uh, one, it will be a light-free brush uh, that it will consist of some of the parts that I'm about to show you, um, and you'll be able to arrange them. So since last week, I went in and I actually built out some new pieces in between ZBrush and also Fusion 360. Uh, a lot of hard surface shells, uh, mech parts and structures, uh, and made a small collection of them uh, to sort of update some collections of uh, hard surface brushes that I've created before. But this time I'm using sort of a new workflow. So uh, just to recap, uh, Fusion 360 is basically a parametric CAD modeling software, right? So basically a little bit different than your traditional uh, versus your uh, versus your, I'm sorry, <laughs> my munchkin just ran in here. But versus your regular workflow of uh, poly modeling, uh, basically you can bring in a solid shape and start doing a lot of uh, very simple and quick uh, bevel work as far as like uh, chamfers and fillets. Uh, you can also do cuts by way of um, cutting the surfaces uh, into design patterns. You can sketch using uh, sort of like a, a path system. Or, or curve system uh, and then from those shapes you can extrude shapes from your sketches uh, and then further you know do booleans uh, bevels that sort of thing it works great for it so for all of the hard surface uh, designers out there it's an excellent tool uh, a lot of concept people and production people have been using it of late uh, and it's very uh, print 3d friendly right because um, mostly what it does is it outputs obj's and stl's so I have created some shells either for arms or legs, and I've kind of put together sort of like a, uh, a block out of a mech um, and in some detail. I'm kicking this over to render it in Keyshot. So, um, cool thing about this is, you know, if you're going to be testing, uh, doing a rendering setup, I'm going to actually shoot this over to Keyshot now, and I'll just show you how I quickly uh, shoot it over and usually do testing for look development. So I laid this out just probably starting from a sphere and I connected each piece uh, sort of like a uh, sort of like in a connected chain thinking about the limbs and how they might move and later I'm probably going to pass this on to a friend of mine who's going to read it. Uh, so I'm kind of keeping those thoughts in mind. Did I show last time my workflow from Fusion to ZBrush? I did, uh, and actually I'm going to recover it here. So let's take a look here. I'm uh, going to open Autodesk Fusion 360, and I'll show you what my typical workflow files sort of look like. Uh, 
and I can also cover again sort of how some of those pieces came together. So just give me a second to launch it here. But yeah, to some detail, detail uh, last time around I uh, actually took um, Fusion, opened it, worked with a shape, uh, and then saved it out. But I'll kind of go over some particulars because uh, with myself, actually, I'm sort of new to Fusion uh, and using it, so I, I can't claim to be a Fusion master, but hopefully I'll be on my way. Uh, it's very robust and easy to use. Uh, I think anybody who probably invested some time and practice over the span of, like, say, a week could probably learn a lot of the basics. So, um, one cool thing is, is that you can actually pull in other shapes so like if you're using the Z modeler you can actually save an OBJ of like just say a simple block out of a shape and bring it in and insert it so here under its menu usually if you have a new menu you can insert a mesh right so it would be an in a mesh that would be inserted uh, I'm not sure if I have one on hand but as I just came from another computer you'll have to excuse me don't have it on hand but you could just create a basic shape Right, so uh, let's sketch one, for example. So I'm gonna look at things from the right, uh, and I have grid view up. All of these down here are a lot of the display uh, settings. So I could either turn my layout layout grid on or off, um, you know, whatever you'd like to go for as far as your preference. But I like to view the grid in each plane because that way, uh, as I lay them out, I can use them to do a lot of my shape building. And if you zoom in, of course, all of those grids get more finite within one cubicle unit, right? Uh, by default, I think a lot of this uh, works with you know, millimeters, but I think you can set your measurement times, of course. So I'm just going to sketch out like a basic shape. And as soon as I click this sketch, you're going to see this small uh, sort of like axis pane here at the center pivot of uh, the world space. So I'm just going to click here. But you could also click uh, anywhere on the... The, the axis that you're working on and it would orient itself and start sketching in that direction. So like if I made a simple shape here, just very quickly, uh, go down, create an angle, and use some of these grids to my advantage. So I'm just gonna snap and snap clicking on each of the points and that would close it up. So now I have a natural sketched plane. And as you can see here at the top of the interface where it says stop sketching. So if I'm done with this sketch, I could actually just click this, but let's try and add onto it. So I, I want maybe some more fine details. So I'm gonna use a square. Uh, and while this is loaded, I'm just gonna on the keyboard, hit control and shift to sort of navigate around. So I'm using the middle mouse button to sort of dolly in, pan in. Uh, and of course, I'm just going to start sketching here. I'll do that. And I'll do a separate piece here as well. So with something like this, as you can see, it's actually going to extend a little bit out. So if I stop sketching, this is actually going to form out as one piece. But I'll select them. And then I'll bring this back over here into view. Uh, and while I have that uh, all, all of the, the three pieces highlighted, I'm just going to hit E on the keyboard, which will bring up the extrude control panel. And I'm going to go for symmetric. And if I turn this, oops, sorry. If I turn this, sorry, it's Alt-Shift. My keys are in a little bit different place from my Mac keyboard, and I am a little bit weird of a weirdo because I have spent some time overseas. I have an actual Japanese keyboard for my Mac. And so every time I switch over back to a regular English PC keyboard, it's a little strange. So you'll have to forgive me if I make a few finger blunders there. But I'm just going to stretch this out and cause some thickness, right? So I'm extruding from, uh, from symmetrically from the actual X axis and causing thickness to this. And of course, I can set that size. So if I wanted to get an actual specific size, I could say 1.0 uh, here. Say a full 
instead of a half a millimeter, I think it's like a full millimeter size. Uh, and there's my block out, right? And so you notice that there's not really much, it's more of like a compound shape. There's not any divisions as far as like um, any loops or anything like that. There's just edges, built blocked out edges, right? Uh, I hope so. I hope I can be a master at this in no time. Uh, there's a few things that I tried to build that are pretty complex that I'll show you guys. But basically, this is how you derive a, a basic block out shape, just from a sketch, right? And the cool thing about this is um, I can hit edges and highlight them. Uh, and then I can go ahead and hit S. And this is about probably the, the quickest workflow that I've found for uh, just messing around building basic shapes into more complex shapes is that less keyboard or key hotkeys that you have to use uh, is probably a good thing because it makes things uh, sped up. So what I do is I use the search feature, which simply on the keyboard, if you hit S, you'll see the model toolbox come up here. And the first couple of items are going to be extrude, fillet, chamfer, and I believe this is scale. But if you were to hit, say, C, uh, you could get chamfer or a couple of other things like combine and it's very handy uh, you can also if you notice in some of these there is sort of an up arrow here next to these so clicking on this will actually um, add it to your menu so if you have any like particular uh, features that are you know you hit a lot you can actually add them up top and sort of automate your feature sets so that's actually really cool but for this all I wanted to do is do a chamfer really quick and it keeps both selected, and I could run a chamfer just on these shapes alone, but I can also hit shift and, of course, add these. Uh, alt shift also uh, will sort of rotate your camera view to wherever you're selecting, so that's kind of handy. Uh, so there, perhaps, uh, and then I'm just holding shift and clicking here uh, just to tie these up a little bit. There we go. Uh, and then I just use this arrow here. So I could set an actual size, but I could also just drag. And the further out from the camera view that you are uh, to the object, I notice that it seems to have some snap tolerances. So like um, the first time I move it, it's gonna be 0.5 millimeters. But I could either highlight this and select a specific number. Uh, let's say, turn that off, and then I'm gonna do 0. Uh, Six five or something like that, right? Maybe not that far. 0 0.5. That's very small. So I'm gonna go 0 0.25. So that's even enough, right? Um, and so that's just a simple chamfer. Now, interesting thing is every time you do this, and sometimes in different angled uh, faces, you're gonna get like an actual ingon built, but it really doesn't matter because in the end. Uh, the flow that I'm showing you guys, you're going to actually output uh, either an OBJ or STL, uh, and that will be tied up with triangulate, triangulation. So basically, what you're kind of getting is not a retopologized top, re piece, uh, but you're going to get a, a piece of geo that's um, closed off by way of tri triangulation, right? So non-subdivided geometry, right? So I'm just going to go in and tie in a few few more shapes here along the edge where I want some of the shapes to be a little bit softer and not hard edged. Uh, I might do like a fillet and just hit commit or just F by itself. There's no control or anything. It's just E and F. Uh, I'm not sure if C is actually connected to the chamfer, but it might be. But again, you could always add those up to the top of the menu. So I'm just going to use like a low setting to just put like a nice little rounded edge on these. Uh, let's see. You can even orient it, and if you click on the face and you push, position your mouse sort of generally in the area where you want it, but you can also on the keyboard hit H, which will create a hole. And this is very cool because instead of making an actual shape that you need to Boolean out, it'll just cut it right out. So I'm gonna set the actual drill type, so just like a straight flat cylinder. Um, you can actually do it pointed if you wanted to, but but what I'm do doing, I just want a solid cut hole through this. So I'm just going to use this arrow to fix the, the actual length. Uh, and this highlight tool here will be the size, right? And so this would be the center point of this circle, right? So I'm just going to size it up. Say OK. 
and then I can hit here. Oops, sorry, again with the different keyboard thing. There we go. Uh, and so, let's see. Oop, whoops. Let's escape that. I'm gonna select that again. And select here. So C is not that. Actually, C is sketching a center uh, circle from uh, like a line. But I'm just gonna go here and hit S again and C. Get the chamfer out. Do something like this. Get the edge nice of the chamfer. There we go. So there's a nice hole with a chamfered in, like a scree hole or something like that, and a few bevels uh, by way of fillets that are kind of just like nice and rounded off, uh, so that we don't have edges that are absolutely hard. Uh, let's do that. Oops. Um, and if you actually right click uh, on your mouse and hold it. Uh, you can get this pie menu here, which has actually got a few nice things about it. Um, sometimes when you select entire shapes, go back here just a bit, and if I was to window select the whole thing, if I wanted to move, I could also move this, rotate it, uh, and also I could create a copy, which sometimes is handy, especially when you're doing uh, Boolean parts that you want to cut out uh, in repetition and you want to make extra copies. You can just do this feature, just hit M, uh, and then make a copy and move it on its axis wherever you need it, right? Uh, and there are also mirror features, right? So if I was to move this off axis, here, I'm gonna hit escape on this, select this one more time, and do something like a mirror. So I've actually got this object selected, and then the mirror plane, I'm actually gonna click on that to select, uh, and then I'm just gonna do it on the X, I click it, and it should come out, but I think this is actually dead center, so I'm not sure how well it's gonna actually work out. Should have moved it over. So let's try that actually. Look at it from the top. Yeah, it's on the center. So let's say I move it. There we go. Back a bit. There we go. Uh, and I say OK, and this way I highlight it again in the window, hit mirror, uh, select these faces, and I'm going to hold Alt-Shift to sort of rotate this around, and I'm going to click on the plane, and then you'll see a ghost copy here, uh, and then say OK, and it'll create a duplicate. And the way to know which piece is which, or select which pieces, is you want to look at the browser. Right, and under browser, you're gonna look under bodies. And so this first body will be this one, and the second will be two, right? And if you were gonna combine these two, you would just simply hold uh, and control click or command click if you're on Mac. Uh, select both, uh, do S, C, and do a combine, right? And the combine feature has different things attached to it um, as far as operations. So if I was to do a simple uh, com combination of two shapes, I would of course hit join. But there's also other ways to work with this that I'm gonna show you. So I'm gonna hit okay here. Uh, and body three should have been both of these. Every once in a while, unless there's something to actually connect it, it doesn't always connect right. Under the construction panel, you can create a construction plane that you can use to mirror from. Yes, I believe I believe so. I haven't I haven't messed with it too much, but I've just done simple mirroring, you know, mirroring from one side uh, to get that perfect symmetry, right? But I think um, if I was to say draw another shape in, I'm gonna draw this one down here. Uh, let's see here. I'm gonna roll in. Switch from tablet to mouse here really quick, because sometimes pointing and clicking is just uh, a little quicker on this. Uh, and then from here to here. Uh, and then you can design the shape up uh, even when you're sketching. So if I hit S and F, so this is the fillet for actual geometry. This you can use on sketches, you noticed. So I'm going to click on the corners here and just round off one end, right? Uh, and I can 
go up and I can actually do the same up here. Smaller bubble over here, 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 here. Uh, I'll do one on this side and here. And then stop the sketch. And then since all of these are gonna be together, There we go. I'm going to hit E. There we go. And just do a one sided right about there. Let's say grab this piece and move it. scale on it because the part is a little small. So I just want to get these two positioned to where they could possibly intersect. I'm going to grab the first body. it you know what actually I'm gonna take body one and just delete it uh, and do something different I could take the same sketch again sketch one and create a new piece again Sorry. Oh, looks like it disappeared on me. Hot damn. Sorry, hold on a second. Sorry, things are a little bit more wonky on my PC side of late. I don't know and understand why but my mouse is acting really janky. Sorry about that. Um To, since some recent updates happened, uh, strangely enough, um, Microsoft did some updates, kind of messed up some things with uh, Wacom devices and a few other things, and I had to basically move all of my work over to my Mac and use it because uh, it didn't have the same problem. <laughs> so. Anyway, uh, what I could do is just probably join two different shapes. So I'm just going to take this one and add a new little just snippet. Cancel this. I'm just going to go here on this plane. And do something like this, right? Click on it, hit E, and basically if I rotate it and look at it, if I go symmetric, it'll pull it out on both sides. So here's the thing, either I could cut this or I could join it. If I joined it, it would actually be two different pieces of geometry uh, that have intersected with each other, and I can set it to join uh, to make one airtight piece of uh, geometry. 
or I could actually take it um, and cut it out. So in other words, like if I really wanted to go through the middle uh, and create sort of like a hole, I could do that. So again, the, this is probably pretty small. It, it's it, piecewise, it, the real world scale is pretty small. Um, I didn't particularly set it to, to centimeters or anything to where it would be a lot larger. But uh, you can take this geometry and just cut it through and it would actually create a hole. Uh, and then, of course, using some of the other features, you could go in and kind of make these nicer shapes by getting some of those edges. And then you could hit F, like say, for example, and round out the edges and create a nice hole, right? So something a little bit more designed. And then you take this piece, um, once you've built up your shapes and done all of your Boolean operations, you can simply just take it uh, and under the create menu, what you're looking for is create base feature. Uh, and then, or at least this is the way that I've done a lot of this stuff, but uh, after that, under modify, there is a mesh menu and you can go B rep to mesh. And what that will do, if you hit preview mesh, it'll actually show you sort of like the tight structure of how it's triangulated out as a non-subdivisional uh, bit of geometry, right? So if I go ahead here and say okay, then under all of the shapes and whatnot, you'll see that it's actually, you know, just like a watertight piece of mesh and you can right click it and either save it out as an STL or an OBJ, right? So if I brought this, if I wanted to mess with this more in ZBrush or something like that and use it using uh, live Boolean features uh, in ZBrush, I could possibly do that by just blocking out a shape, uh, hooking up some bevels and some other, you know, really nice uh, Boolean operation cuts, and then go into ZBrush uh, with the same OBJ file uh, and then do further edits. So what I did in that is I created some shapes like this. So here's a mech foot that will be in the brush that I'm creating for you guys, but uh, this is just an example of sort of like basic to complex geometry. There we go. So a few piston shapes and uh, foot pad shapes put together. I'm making this sort of as a, as a, a sort of basic model that um, the more pieces that you have and stuff um, from Fusion, the more pieces that you may have to unfortunately uh, break apart uh, because of the way that it combines shapes when you make a, a B rep mesh. Sometimes you have to get in there and take uh, smaller chunks of the model out and, and cut them out as SDLs or OBJs and pair them together somewhere else. Um, and so that's kind of a drag, but at least I try to organize it so that. You know, even if I'm saving out eight OBJs, I can just plop them in one piece after another, um, sort of like in, in, in a way where, you know, if you create, like, say, using uh, a basic polymesh 3D shape uh, in your subtool palette, you can actually just hit import and in import your shapes over that base shape in ZBrush, right? And so they'll all stack up as subtools, um, and then it'll look like this. Here, I'll try to show you in ZBrush how it came, came out. I believe it was this guy. Okay, so here's the same mech foot. I call it the mech toe. But uh, poly framed out. So each of these poly groups is an individual piece of geometry that I had to bring in, right? Uh, and then once I had them all aligned and paired, uh, and just as a footnote, this shape here, this purple uh, polygrouped area here, uh, this one actually was one piece that I created using um, Z Remesher. Actually, no, sorry, not Z Remesher, the Z Modeler brush. Uh, and then I just blocked out a simple shape and then saved it as an OBJ from ZBrush. Uh, and then I took it into Fusion and I had to sort of do the reverse of what I just showed you. So I know this is a little bit confusing, but I, I think if you guys were to try your homework out uh, and maybe take a look, you'll finally figure this out. But um, what I showed you between, let's go back here. What I showed you between um, the create menu and create uh, base feature, 
You can also create a mesh. Uh, and so once you import that OBJ, I hit create mesh, uh, which makes a new body basically. Uh, and then use the same uh, mesh feature and modify to sort of go in the reverse. So there's a B rep to mesh and then there's mesh to B rep inside of Fusion. Uh, so playing with those, you can have some varying results as far as like taking geometry from someplace else. Uh, also, Autodesk does have a few good videos uh, on YouTube, I think, uh, to sort of explains how it sort of works. So I think a quick Google and maybe a search on YouTube should yield some results. But getting into getting it into ZBrush, of course, from these basic shapes uh, that I've already done a lot of Boolean work with, uh, sort of shaped it up inside of uh, Fusion, now the interesting part would be okay, well, there's a lot of flat areas, what would I do to this? So naturally, I created an IMM from it so that I could use this piece, you know, however many times. Hi, how's it going? Thanks, thanks for the message. But um, you can take these parts and you can do other Booleans for it. So inside of ZBrush. So if you wanted to add, say, surface noise or little small, you know, inset pieces of uh, geometry, to sort of give this some nice design shape. Uh, sort of like in the same vein as uh, some of these small holes down here or this little inset bit of geometry or cut lines or design shapes that you want to cut out of the geometry. Um, you can perfectly do that uh, by simply doing this. So straight up from the top from the render tab, I'm going to hit the external render, uh, turn on my key shot because I'm going to be sending things there. Uh, and then render booleans, you want to make sure that you actually select live boolean. So I'm going to actually just dial in my loop here so that you can see this. So render booleans, live boolean, right? That means that at any time I could probably turn this shape into what is called a start group. Um, and then from that start group, any subtool after, below it, is actually going to be either positive or negatively booleaned out. Uh, so I'll just try something maybe from here um, Doing a basic shape. So if I took this uh, In fact, let me turn this off just for a second and then I'm going to duplicate it just to work on a copy That way we don't have to worry about anything being lost uh, So I'll turn this guy off and hide it and I'm just going to use a simple IMM uh, I use a lot of the primitives um, to do a lot of things so if I hit M, of course, uh, basically what I did was I hit B on the keyboard, I to bring up a lot of the insert or IMM, insert multi-mesh brushes, and then I hit the primitives, right, the first primitives. So it's base type, insert, mesh, dot, right? Uh, and from these primitives, basically I can hit M on the keyboard and choose which one that I want to use. I'm going to use the cylinder extended, uh, which is really cool. It's probably one of the easiest. There's also, I noticed, uh, it took me a minute to actually realize, but I think probably Joe, uh, Joseph Drust maybe made this, but uh, there's a really cool IMM Boolean uh, brush that's already preloaded into uh, ZBrush by default, and it has some really cool shapes that you can also use. So if you look at this and hit in, it has a really big collection, but it's got like holes, um, you know, cylinder or mech, uh, I guess what you call greeble parts. Uh, that you can use frame pieces uh, and you can make some interesting cuts into your design from that right okay so B I, B I go back to my primitives hit M choose this guy and I'm just gonna right here on this block choose my subtool go in here and do this and I didn't do it in symmetry but that's okay uh, if you ever do that and you forgot to turn on your transform, really quick way to do things, just put it in there. Uh, I've customized my UI a little bit for a few quick uh, functions that I, I use a lot, so I'm just going to split mask points instead of going to the split menu. And so there's my new small shape, and because I drew it on a start object, I'm actually going to have to uncheck this on the actual object that I drew. Uh, and to get it in symmetry, really quick. Uh, because it's sitting on the opposite side maybe of the X actually no it is along the X see that red line there that would be the X so for those that are just starting out ZBrush um, that's sort of how 
these axis line works. The red, of course, is the X, green is the Y up, and blue is the Z forward. So with that in mind, I've got this on the X. So I'm gonna take it and just go into geometry, go into modified topology and mirror and weld, right? This is where I hit my move tool uh, and I'm gonna hit X and make sure that this time I have symmetry. And I'm just gonna move the shape inward so we inset it a little bit, right? So keep your thickness in mind. Uh, and then, looking at my subtools, yep, it's been separated. I'm gonna hide the floor, get rid of that, so it's not in our way. Uh, and then now, what I can do is, of course, kick this subtool down. So I'm gonna hit Q and go back into draw mode. Shape is there. I'm gonna drop it down a little bit under the star. And now, what I can do, of course, uh, is just set this icon here. So this is probably positive and then this is intersecting or actually this is negative and then this is intersecting. Right? So I'm going to display it as intersecting and as you notice it's actually giving you a live preview of the shape taken out. Right? So of course this is still a shape and what I can do if I want to repeat it is I'm gonna hold the Alt key. Actually, which is it? Is it Alt? There we go. Alt, while you're in the gizmo, actually unlocks it. So I'm just gonna rotate, holding Alt down and then hitting Shift on the keyboard. I'm actually snapping my rotation into uh, degree ticks. So I'm gonna go 40 and straighten it out. Uh, and then I'm gonna hit Control, drag, Click shift and drag this down so I can repeat that and so what it did was it actually masked the first object and made a copy underneath so same alignment and everything I'm gonna push this back and then I'm gonna hit uh, shift and actually rotate this a few clicks in the opposite way hit Q and you can see it's taking out so I'll control drag on the canvas which will release the mask and there's my shape right and so for this little edit now what I can do is I can just take this uh, and go back to your boolean and make boolean mesh which basically makes a union mesh and the way that that works is once it makes a union mesh it's almost like adaptive scanning um, you can come back up here and just append it and so now here's the appended subtool of course, just kind of off to the side, I'll have to turn these off, and there you go. So now I can send this over, key shot. Sweet. All right. So I'll alt tab on over. I think I need to start key shot up. Sorry about that. Usually, it would have already started by now. Updated this thing in forever. All right, so I'm just gonna close all this. I'll try it again. I'm gonna go over here, uh, and we need to do another BPR. Just making sure again uh, on the render tab, external render key shot. See, it was unchecked because it was a new uh, added appended mesh. So anyway, uh, make sure on the external render you want to check on key shot and I'm going to hit auto merge but you can actually do groups by materials if you have materials painted on this and you can differentiate them how you like. Anyway, I'm going to go to do a BPR. It's going to use the bridge, send it over to key shot and boom there's our foot. All right. So kind of in the same way uh, this is how I got started on doing some renders that I was going to show you guys. Uh, and for illustration purposes, 
let's say I go back, right? Because I can then take this and adjust my lighting, my material, um, add HDR lighting, uh, and get it all nice and spiffy. But let's take our other design that actually has more to it. Right? I'll frame this mesh. And since this one is a little bit more complex and it actually has poly paint on it, I'm going to hit this and it will kick it over to key shot. And it's just going to recache the files and probably blink this over and replace that one singular object uh, with the new objects that are being prepared and sent over. Uh, after this stream, by the way, um, as I did promise to you guys, I'm going to make um, a couple of brushes for you. I'm going to get into that in just a few minutes at the top of the hour. So let's just take a few minutes to do just sort of like a basic setup in Keyshot, right? So out of ZBrush, after I've done all of my placement and work, uh, sculpting on the object, I might want to preview it in Keyshot. It's, it's always a good idea to sort of see how things light up um, when you have a you know something as intense as like a really good GPU render or uh, in the case of Keyshot it's a CPU brute force render which means that it's going to use most of your CPU cores and power to hurry up and do sort of like almost a very nice clean uh, render of your object uh, and therefore I'm going to actually set my perspective first so I'm going to look at it straight a little bit more straight on so uh, set it basically maybe 275 should be almost the same uh, perspective number as like a 75 millimeter lens on a camera uh, and let's see let me zoom in here and get this guy squared up there we go and I like the front angle here so what I made for you guys is basically a set of um, hard surface brushes and also like cowlings together and there are a couple of other brushes that I'm going to probably get to explaining later that will be bundled with it. Uh, I'm going to give you guys a light free version of the brush that I'll try to put up on ZBC so yay for that but a lot of the more complex shapes I'm actually going to bundle together and I should have maybe this weekend at least definitely by Monday um, I'm preparing a lot of like um, previews and stuff like that for it but uh, I'm going to actually have it on my Gumroad page so if you wanted to pick it up, I'm probably going to price it, you know, pretty cheap, but uh, you can find me at gumroad.com forward slash Tony Koro. That's T-O-N-I-K-O-R-O. -O. And I'll give you guys sort of a look at my page here. But in here, uh, I'm going to place it under a, a product here, but I actually also have some other uh, small amounts of... Uh, like hard surface brushes that I did maybe a while back ago, maybe about two years ago. Um, but I'm going to make a new set and put them up here for sale. But uh, I will have a brush, sort of a light brush, that won't have all the pieces, but sort of a usable amount of pieces that I'll give out for free. Uh, and you guys can demo it and try it out and see if it works for you. Because um, the interesting thing about behind kit bashing is, is that I always suggest to people before you make a kit bash set or use start using kit bashes like heavily to do a lot of modeling, uh, is to make sure that they're sort of in the same vein as something that you want. So if there's a sort of stylistic choice that you like, it, it's probably best to make your own set so that it has all of your visual language. But also, I want to create new parts of visual language that I can share with, with other artists so that they could do blockouts or silhouettes um, to sort of derive visual lang new visual language out of that which I've already established. It's sort of an experiment is, is my... And so, you know, it gets really interesting when, if I think of a shape and then I hand it off to the next person and they take and interpret those shapes uh, in a sort of composition that uh, suits their aesthetic and then if it came back my way or I saw it, I would go, hmm, okay, cool, people are using this this way and it, it gets to be interesting uh, study-wise, right? So I made this uh, quadruped like sort of uh, mech tank here. Uh, I'm gonna throw in maybe some environment stuff uh, as far as an HDRI. Uh, 
I have one in mind that I like to use. It's my downtown LA shot. I drove around downtown LA, uh, sort of a Blade Runner fit, uh, hopping out of my car, taking photos with the Gear 360 camera. <laughs> And I made a bunch of HDRIs of it. I had to experiment with it for a while, but uh, I made some of my own custom lighting, which is pretty cool. Um, every once in a while, depending on the camera, you can get some really cool uh, light sources. So this one was taken downtown above my car in the late afternoon uh, so that I would have different light sources, uh, say like artificial lights, man-made lights plus you know regular sky uh, lighting and depending on the material it picks up quite nice but um, let's make some some settings really quick here so um, I'm going to set like a custom lighting preset uh, and then I'm going to use a shadow quality of 5 which is something I've been doing of late and the ray bounces I'm actually going to turn them down just so that uh, maybe I can get a quicker render uh, and then I'm actually going to turn on global illumination, but I'm only going to use it by a slight bit, so maybe one or two, All right? Uh, and then in the environment tab on the project tab, or it's project and then environment, uh, I'm actually going to maybe brighten this a little bit, go around and do some more sort of like global touches, like uh, changing the light environment for a background color. go and maybe pull this out just a little bit let's get a little tinge of cool blue okay uh, and for illustration this is sort of like a, a weird nice little uh, juncture but for illustration you know you might want to use line and if you go back in some of the ZBrush uh, the ZBrush live uh, episodes that I've done in the past, especially early on, I explained how to set up some tune shaders uh, and use those outputs to generate sort of line art from ZBrush. And it's really, it's a really quick process. But you can also do it for more like uh, graphic presentations of things. So I'm going to start with that. Uh, but you could use normal materials. Um, like if you go into the materials and you make your own. Uh, metal that has maybe like an edge wear or something like that. I use a lot of customs myself. Uh, let's say for example uh, Frederick Doust made a really cool material that I like to use on uh, mecha and whatnot or hard surface designs. Uh, it's called a spacesuit. And so I'll try to use that one. Uh, just a light damage one. But you could use something like this and of course holding alt Clicking and dragging onto the piece, and dragging and dropping, you can apply those materials uh, directly to your shapes. And if you have uh, vertex color or, or poly paint on it, uh, the poly paint will carry over to Keyshot, and then you want to use Alt and click and drag to make it carry over. So I'm not sure about this, but like it seems like maybe uh, I might want to use a different material for that object. Uh, but anyway. Uh, you can put normal materials, you know, like shaded materials on it. Um, I actually, for the sake of illustration, wanted to mess around with using some more of the tune shaded. Uh, so I kind of start off with tune outline black. And so I'll just drag and drop this here. Uh, and just off of the first initial piece, if I go ahead and right click and then edit the material, uh, you can edit the material straight off. Uh, or sometimes you can mess around with it by using the material graph, but what I wanted to do here is basically set a different color. I'll say okay. Uh, and then I want to change basically the contour width and the angle. I'm not going to use shadow and I'm not going to use transparency uh, because I think it would distort the object a little bit as far as like um, any type of shading patterns that would end up in the render. So I'm not going to use that, but uh, I will change uh, the contour angle so that it picks up a little bit more of the details. Now normally this is somewhere around 30, but I noticed in and around 12 to 14 maybe, it has a pretty good uh, angle with that measurement. So in between like say 12 to 20, you can get it angled right so it maybe 
more finite detail that's sculpted into an object, it's going to come in sort of like hairline. And sometimes, depending on which way you turn the model, it's going to show more detail than not on the shape. Uh, and of course, I have ground shadows under the shape, uh, all of the shapes. Uh, so it's picking up sort of sort of like a FOSS X pattern shadow underneath here. But uh, let's go here. These guys are red. And I'll show you how this works. Do another one just for gray areas. And no, I don't want to link them. It'll put it in. Uh, and then, of course, I can edit the material. And I'll pick a similar gray, something like that. Ooh. Sorry. Uh, this mouse, I need to replace it. Jumping around. It's alive! Any questions for now? Any, did anybody miss anything that, it, that I might have mentioned and sort of just kept running with? If so, do let me know. Uh, I'm actually going to do like a copy material and then I'm going to click on the other piece and actually just paste the linked material to carry it over and do the same for those on the back side, on the reverse side of the mech. Turn this guy, do it here. So paste the material. Copy this guy. And paste the material. And I'll do it again for here. And I'll edit this one. Uh, actually, I should unlink this unlink the material there so that this individual piece I can change up, right? So I, I want to make it darker. And of course I can preview all of this by hitting Shift F, which will go full screen. Uh, and with this there's not, there's not much I can change when I'm viewing the whole thing, but at least, you know, I think my settings for rendering are probably going to be fast enough for this. Uh, it's kind of funny, depending on the video card and the actual CPU, um, probably more so the CPU. The more cores you have, the more calculated power that uh, Keyshot has to use at its disposal. But I can put this sort of outline uh, material from the tune shape on each different individual piece and then color those pieces uh, and I get sort of like a nice graphic look um, to something like this. Uh, to show you an example without taking much time, uh, because I have one more hour and I'd love to do some this sort of free jam stuff with some of these brushes, and I actually need to show you guys these brushes. Uh, there's something, there's some really cool parts in some of them and features to them, to others. Um, let me actually go back here. Uh, what was I going to do? that. Uh, I'm going to actually open up Photoshop as I did. Uh, oops. There we go. So I'm probably running on my other machine. So I'll just sign out. See so about that. Probably running. Uh, Photoshop on my other machine or machines. Oops. There we go. Get over there. All right. So if 
Photoshop opening. Actually, just to save myself a little processing power, I'm going to come back over to Keyshot. Uh, one of the things that you can do is, because it's a real-time render, you can actually... Oop, it's forcing Photoshop for... Let me... There we go. Okay, so I can come over here and just to, so I don't bog my machine down, I can actually hit pause on the render. And so therefore the viewport's uh, live rendering is actually gonna slow, you know, just be on pause for a minute. Uh, one cautious thing is if you are using Bridge, remember to unpause this or else uh, it will actually turn Keyshot Bridge off and just do a BPR. Uh, so just be careful of that one. I've run into that every once in a while. I inherently run into that problem. And then I have to uncheck it and do it again. Or recheck it, basically. Uh, let's see. Where did I just put my parts? Ah, uh, here we go. Okay. So... I hooked up something like this this to show you guys. So here's just um, a quick illustration that I did um, using the tune shader and the actual model as is. And I went through and I set up and colored out, um, you know, just a few simple uh, materials to sort of bring out the silhouette. And so, you know, you can do something like this and do a, like a nice uh, viewport render. Actually, believe it or not, uh, this uh, render of it is just a low res render. Uh, at 1080p that I wanted to put out um, and I full screened it and actually took a screenshot once it had sat for about five minutes uh, and the quality was good enough so just for illustration purposes you can take a screenshot and actually make turn it into something viable now the same for these here this is what it actually kind of looks like with um, some materials put to it uh, and using an HDR lighting uh, system with uh, the HDRI editor I think I have a few hot points of light and so you know you kind of get start to feel how uh, light moves over an object uh, or any of the designed shapes that you build you know you kind of pick up some nice highlights and stuff you can actually add lights to geometry and move them sort of off frame and get more than one lighting source so that's at least really cool uh, and I also use it as a clay render every once in a while so if you pluck a sort of just like a diffuse white material depending on the shadow settings and the brightness and contrast of your render uh, you could probably get a result like this ending in a nice you know sort of like a, just a, a AO or shadow render clay render either one uh, so this is something that'll be kind of um, uh, an advertisement for this that I've put together and I'll probably post it soon in uh, Pixelogical, uh, Pixelogic Official, or probably on Facebook. I'll probably post it up there and let you guys have a look at some rendered shots. But uh, this is sort of the end result of doing something. Now, um, if I was to render this in black and white, of course, I can use Photoshop to sort of separate uh, the line art. And with tune shading, uh, with color, I can actually just do like sort of basic key or like concept um, like technical illustrations because it the lines are so clean if I was to redraw this and add other details I could do that or I could repaint it uh, but this is just like the fills that I have per material on the object right but you start to pick out sort of the difference between like complex areas of focus in between here uh, and because of the angle uh, some shapes are not outlined to their entirety and so therefore I have sort of like uh, areas of rest um, these blank areas here in between the ball of the Mac, um, I'm actually still working on and probably uh, before I get this to the more like animation quality, I'm going to make some cuts and redesign some, sh some parts in this midsection, creating an eye and a couple of other places. But um, now, uh, at least I have this much and I'm trying to lay it out in a way that uh, I keep in mind sort of like the pivot points of various uh, limb parts. So maybe there's a major cylinder here. I need to add another cylinder here so that uh, the leg piece can go left, uh, in, left and right in a pivot uh, and give it some, some sway. And then this, of course, will be the vertical up-down pivot for the whole leg. 
uh, and then maybe something on, on the, along those lines down here, maybe a few more hydraulics, uh, and then I'll add pads to the feet or something, or more shell pieces, uh, just to flush it out. But uh, from what I've built for you guys, should you uh, pick up the full brush set, um, I'm going to show you what they look like here. So I actually have to load them back up because I worked on another machine, uh, and then I saved it over my Google Drive, and then I have to bring it over to this machine and set it up again, but I'll just load uh, a few of them. Uh, here we go, as I back them up. Okay, so I'm going to start with this uh, KB, 2018 KB set 01. I'm going to load that one, and I'll show you what these are. I'm going to grab a sphere and sort of show you the beginnings of this. So I'm going to take a sphere, make a poly mesh 3D, and so now with symmetry turned on, I can work with some of these pieces. And if I pull this out, these are all of the pieces that I made for the entire full set of this brush. Uh, and it's mostly like structural pieces or plates. Uh, and then, uh, I'm going to mess with these in just a sec, but I'm going to load the other ones just so you can see what they are. Uh, loading this brush, I'm going to open the cowlings too. And so the cowling pieces are more sort of like sort of like these uh, major silhouette parts, right? So kind of like if you think of like the outer shell design of a motorcycle or a mech or a car, all of these smaller pieces are going to be plates, right? So I can probably fill out more of my, my silhouette with some of these shapes, but it's nice to have something underneath, right? So again, here's that mech foot and here's the upper part for it. And you can use these pieces. Uh, a lot of them are either uh, uh, non-subdivided geometry or in the case where I do a lot of uh, contouring uh, where they have more fluid sort of organic shapes to them uh, what I'll do is I'll decimate them right so any which way to keep the topology light and then of course you can use Z-Remesher to Z-Remesh these parts uh, I believe there's polygroups that should be able to be derived so like if you do it by the polygroup it by the normal or by the edge uh, shape, you be, should be able to um, either Z-remesh it or Dynamesh it at a high resolution and then cut that down by Z-remeshing it. So they, they can be topologized. Or if you're hardcore, I suppose you could take it and uh, re-topologize it by hand, right? But just to, just to show, you know, I can uh, line this up in the center, and I'll go back and I'll get the other uh, and let's see I'll just take a basic frame piece here and draw these out here there we go let's see if we can make a sort of tripod And of course, so there's three of them. Uh, from the center, we'll draw one, but if I use uh, symmetry, you know, and I spread out where I'm drawing it, it's going to make two different uh, bodies. And of course, these are different uh, polygroups. So either I can split masked points, uh, and then I can come back, hit Alt, click on this, get the gizmo, hold Control click on the different polygroup, split mast again, and so now I have a, an even split. I'm not drawing things on the ball, but I've split everything from the main shape so that I can treat them as different subtools, right? So I do a lot of this where if I use an insert mesh or insert mesh uh, primitives to, to sort of block out a shape, I do a lot of splitting mast points, um, merging visible, uh, group split sometimes, um, and I just keep those handy, mirror and weld and you can really build something really pretty fast. Are the kit bash parts made in ZBrush? Uh, some of them are made in different uh, apps. So like, just for example, if you, you had been watching it earlier, I'm using uh, Fusion 360 to do some really hard um, or complex hard surface shapes. And then I'm actually saving these out as OBJ parts individually and then rebuilding it back or reassembling it inside of ZBrush. 
right? So because of the intensity, it doesn't really matter here as far as like the topology and building bevels uh, and doing sort of Boolean operations. I did a lot of work to cut out of my basic blocked out shapes that I did from ZBrush. Like this started with this whole block here. Uh, and then I made an actual shape. In fact, let me open a couple of others and I'll show you sort of like my layout of some of these shapes. And the cool thing about Fusion is it, it actually saves uh, to a cloud, it's cloud-based. So once you make an account, um, if you're a student or anything and doing some learning, you can get a student version. I, I think I have an educational license. Um, but when you pull it up, uh, it'll show you all of your data in the data browser, uh, which are all not saved locally, but they're actually saved to a cloud, so which is really cool. Oh, no worries. No worries, Blind Fox. Yeah, um, if, if you get to watch this um, broad, uh, this stream in, in, in replay, uh, you'll see sort of like how I was doing some basic things in Fusion uh, also last week, or actually, what was it? It was week before last, actually. Um, I actually took some of these shapes and just built a simple shape and did a, a few basic features to show you sort of how I would approach uh, cutting objects out, extruding, um, chamfering, doing fillet, uh, fillet uh, cuts and whatnot uh, to some of the edges and stuff like that to round it out. And you know, you take your time and zone out and get into the grind and before you know it, you have some really complex shapes, you know. Um, small greeble areas like this. Like, let me see if I can pull in. So, as you can visually notice, this is the piece that I was just drawing on. Uh, and there's a few more of these that I've put together in this list, but you can add them, use them. Uh, I sort of put them together as, as sort of like blocks or chunks of structural piece. Uh, so I'm going to be probably experimenting more and more with this in the future. Uh, using these to build hard surface shapes and then uh, going the whole nine yards inside of ZBrush uh, to build something out. But it becomes really nice and clean and topology wise, again if you look at this, I'll turn on the polyframes, uh, go into draw, uh, I'm going to hit dynamic solo so I can see these individually. So here you notice that the polyfaces are not like quadded out. Right? They're not four-sided. Some of them are tries, some of them are triangulated areas that were in gons that but they have to be uh, they, because they're non-deformable, right? So they're not going to bend, so I don't really have to worry about uh, if an ingon is there, I just triangulate it and then it close it up so that it's watertight. Uh, and the same thing goes for like if you were 3D printing or something, right? So it'll recognize all the shapes, the holes, uh, nice smooth uh, fillets on some of the edges. And it'll actually sort of compensate and calculate all of the the angles of the topology and, and the faces. It'll cut them down. Uh, you can take meshes that are not triangulated, say from ZBrush, and move them over. Um, and so that's sort of like I, how I got the top part of the foot that I was working with earlier. But now that I have that ball section out, I'm gonna hide the floor again and just align this to camera. And I'm going to take another piece, uh, maybe say this guy, and just draw. All right? So that's on both sides. And so I just want to use the gizmo, and size these guys up. You see how this is when I'm scaling it, it's actually moving away from the mesh. One way to get around that is because um, I don't have LSIM on. So I'm just going to turn LSIM on and actually scale from here and now I can get a better scale locally. There we go. Pull this down. And I want to think of, like, say this is a joint pivot and this is another joint pivot. So pull this out a little bit and align it just where I can, just where I feel it's right, all right? And so you can kind of use these parts as a sketch. So I'm just gonna be quiet for a minute and take a moment to dry out some stuff, yeah? So, split, 
take that out of solo. So now I have two limbs. take other kits and pieces that I've made um, and add them as well. I like to use this piece for sockets and whatnot, but uh, I'm going to make this a socket pivot. This is one I created a while back ago. Um, it's just sort of, sort of like a, a robotic limb joint, it's sort of easy to use. But I like to figure out the sort of innards of a mech and then work my way out a lot of the times. So that looks good. There we go. And later I can join these together. Uh, if I keep the polygroups, I can manage things a lot uh, better. Um, if these two are joined, like let's say I drew this and I'm just gonna clear the mask. So this piece, this new piece, is actually part of this one because I think I, that was the, the subtool that was last uh, selected. Uh, but for those that are sort of new to ZBrush, um, I can separate them again because if you notice, their drawn polygroup is different. And I can take the gizmo and hold Control or Command if you're on a Mac, and just simply click on the different uh, polygroup, and it'll automatically mask off the shape opposite to that. Uh, and then I can just use my split mask points. All right. So let's hide this ball shape. And so now, really, if you look at this, I'm just I'm I'm just creating a, a pair of legs, and I can add another limb down. And I've already uh, I was kind of careful when I created these. Uh, so when you guys, if if you purchase this whole set, or if I if you're messing with the light version that I'm going to hook up this evening. Uh, what you can do is kind of use it just to sketch out a silhouette. Like, even if I'm unsure about the mechanics and I don't want to waste a bunch of time, um, you know, as a designer, worrying about all of the little small bits of things. I'm going to build, you know, overall shape. That's kind of where I created this here. Uh, I'll do this, and you get some frame pieces um, along with. Uh, Let me separate this, split mask points. Uh, I can alt click and select the tool if it's not selected, uh, and you can sort of jump, right? So, alt clicking on different shapes will jump sub tools in your menu, so that way you don't actually have to go over here and click on each individual part, right? So, then I'll take this uh, and I'll move it into place. If you hold alt, actually, which unlocks the gizmo, and click on an object. I think actually this one will reorient it, uh, and this one will actually place it. There we go. For some reason I can't, it's too far out for me to hit on the center, but it will actually, there we go. It's a little bit more centered. Uh, so I'll just pull this frame forward. So now I, I have more of like a waist frame. There we go. And you can just sketch this out, right? So that looks kind of cool. Uh... Oh, okay, I see. I'm gonna undo that. I think I forgot to split it. Uh, and then I just used the gizmo. Uh, one thing that I should explain is if you have a part that you put down and you have the gizmo displayed, um, of course, you know, when R8 came out, uh, I think Paul and everybody mentioned this one, but you can actually change up your shapes, your shape language. So, like, if I have this piece here and I want to change it out for, say, this piece, I can just click while the gizmo is, is on, I can click on another uh, insert multi mesh, and with it, the gizmo applied, it'll actually change it out for me. Not sure why it's not working in this instance, but you can do that. So I 
take this and actually move it up. This here, rotate it down. Some movable area in there. I'm gonna scale this a little bit. Pull that to there. Free dag, Pesic 16. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, okay, so there's sort of basic part of the frame. It's where torso, and we have our legs sort of in an open stance, and I can actually connect things in between here. And before I start to get to secondary and tertiary forms, let me just throw some shells on there and then I can look at the overall silhouette. So what I like to do is actually just kind of take um, some of the cowling shapes and whatnot, uh, add those, and then I can see sort of how oops, things fare out overall. I think I can combine those two. Uh, take this and move it. Rotate it down. So it's kind of like a build your basic Mac garage shop here. <laughs> Something like that, yeah? And I'll bend this down, pull this out a little bit. You know, get to it, do some sketching. I'm gonna unlock this and uh, rotate there. And that way I can pull this out straight. There we go. Uh, and then, Let's see. I'll take a few shells. Uh, these guys I like to use on the legs. These are really cool. You can use them on legs or shoulders. That's kind of the idea. Uh, put this here. That looks good. Maybe a little bit. Rotate. Bring this down. Size this up a little bigger. Take this downward. There we go. Uh, and of course, you know, like if it was a floating frame rather than something floating, I would actually build out some shapes uh, to fit the contour. So you could match it up. Uh, like if if you were going to do like an entire leg shell, I would start from like a start point like this, uh, and then I made some brackets in here somewhere. Uh, if you actually go into, I believe the first set that I showed you guys, the the O one set. There are some plate bracket holders at the end uh, of the at the end of the brush. There we go. So that looks kind of cool. I'll take it and split mask points again. This mesh is partially hidden. How is that? Huh. All right. Huh. Do that. And these. Thank you. Use this trick again. And split mask points. Wow, it's telling me that something's hidden in here. Uh, if that's the case, and I can't find out where it is, this is what I'm going to do. There's something hidden, a hidden piece of geometry. Uh, on this subtool and I can't figure it out and I don't think it's really necessary so I'm just gonna come over uh, we're gonna do modify topology and then I'll just delete hidden uh, and then I'm gonna use the gizmo clear the mask select this part split mask points and there we go two different pieces right shift F come out of polyframe view uh, and then, you know, as you can see, you can keep building up, right? So I have a dark material, kind of, um, I think this one is Zebro's uh, Gray EX, which I believe he probably still has a link for it. Zebro is a really cool South Korean uh, sculptor who's made some materials for ZBrush early on. And I think he has, like, a page where you can download them. Uh, these last two parts, are they made in Fusion as well? Yes. So like, say this geometry here and this geometry here were made in Fusion. A lot of the shell pieces that I made for you guys, those are all ZBrush, right? Because I would just take like a, a normal sh uh, shape, um, kind of similar to 
a method that I was trying out, uh, sort of borrowed from Marco Pluf uh, and Frederick Dous, the Chaos Masons guys. Um, they had a really cool way of uh, doing some contouring in which you would do panel looping uh, off of sort of like a, a sculpted up shape. So what I would do is I would just, here, I'll just quickly do this. Uh, if I take a, a sphere, say for example, just a basic sphere, make polymesh 3D. And I'm gonna up the res of this. So I'm gonna hit control D. And then I'm going to maybe, I mean, you could start with lower. It doesn't really matter until you really start to do the contouring of your shape. But I'm just gonna delete lower on the shapes and I have a pretty thick mesh here, right? Uh, I'll select white, oh, auto save. There we go. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Sorry, my autosave is probably set maybe a little too close to the mark. There we go. Okay. I'm going to select white so that way you guys can see this. Uh, you could do this uh, by drawing it out and then using mask by luminosity, I believe it is. Um, but I'm just going to draw like a straight up mask, right? But it, as you can see, if I turn on my floor, I look things at things straight on, right? So you could draw a mask on a circle or any type of contoured shape that you would make. So like if I hit M, get a really big brush, and I start shaping this up. out a little bit now so that's basic like sort of like a base shape now I'm gonna grab just a standard brush start painting in a mask so this way I'll just hit uh, control or command and with symmetry I'll draw out a mask shape Fill it, maybe make the brush a little bit bigger, fill that mask, the inside area. There we go. Okay. And so I would take this and I would sharpen it. So in other words, like control alt. Uh, if you double tap on the open areas, it'll sharpen the mask. And that's only going to be as good as the resolution of your mesh. So if you have something that's like a really clean selection that you need to make, I would up the resolution and then draw it. Uh, because basically these are polys, right? It's not pixels, it's polys. Uh, I'm going to hit Control alt and just sort of erase around some areas. Sort of basic ZBrush stuff, right? So once I have this uh, mask applied, um, what I would do is I would just polygroup it by hitting Control W, and as you can see, it's two different uh, polygroups, right? So to shell this out, I'm actually just going to take and hit the transpose and or Hard surface modeling, yes. But it, a lot of t times what I do is, because I, I kind of specialize in hard surface, but also illustration, is uh, I use ZBrush uh, and KeyShot together, along with a few other applications to do hard surface designs that I turn into 2D meshes or 2D static meshes or illustrations entirely, uh, either by way of using the prop uh, in a scene uh, to paint over, or sometimes I'll throw toon shaders on it just to get sort of like a line quality and then I'll redraw it or repaint it or edit the actual line art. Uh, you can pretty much do anything with the render 
You know, it's just um, a tool and how you choose to use it. Yeah. So I'm gonna control click on this polygroup and mask it out, or I can just simply go into the draw mode by hitting Q, uh, and then I'm going to hold Alt and sh uh, actually sorry, Control Shift, and I'm, I have a uh, either a lasso or a wreck, either one, for selecting. I'm just going to click on the burgundy one, hide it, get rid of it. So modify topology, delete hidden, and there's my shell piece, right? But you can't use it like this. So basically what I'm going to do is do a couple of things for the shape of it by using Z Remesher. And I explained this maybe probably stream before last, I think it was either two or three streams ago, uh, but very quickly the workflow for this sort of thing is um, I would take a high res or a dynameshed uh, silhouette of the shape, the shell that I want, uh, and then I want to do a group loops on it. So group loops really quick, which will tighten up sort of the contour of the outside of it. And if I wanted to do it further before I actually, it'll actually hold the shapes with the group loops, right? But if I wanted to, I could always come down to deformation uh, and maybe do something like uh, polish by groups is also a, a good one. I would do it in a low number at first to see if you could maintain some of those uh, hard transitions between the, the shape. Uh, and then you could do a group loop, right? So I'm going to come up here. There we go. Group loop. Group loops. Hard to say. It's a tongue twister. Okay. So I have the shape, and it's holding at the edge, and now I want to actually use the Z-Remesher, uh, and I'll get my target size. So I'm gonna actually go 0 0.5 maybe. Uh, adaptive is cool, but not entirely necessary. I mean, you just kind of experiment with it a little bit. Sometimes this works out good, and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, you can also use framing the mesh. Um, which under the stroke menu, you can come over uh, and under the curve functions, you can go into curve mode. Uh, actually, you know what? You don't need that. But you do need this. And you can just frame it on the outside. And that might hold the shape a little bit better. So if I do something like 80 or 90, um, and then let's test it out. Boom. So okay, that knocked it down quite a bit, and still held held the shape. Uh, and even this at this level, you could do some things with like the uh, Z Modeler brush, which is really cool. Um, but from this shape, I want to actually add some thickness because if you look, uh, I don't have display set to double, but I could turn that on. Uh, visibility. No. Display properties. Sorry. Uh, and then hit double, and so that way you can see front and back. But as you can see, it's just one simple plane. It doesn't have any thickness. So for that, we use panel loop. So I go back up. Uh, and under panel loop, what I'm going to do is I'm going to loop it, but I only want one loop, no polish, zero bevel, and I want to go from the surface inward. So I'm actually going to change this elevation from 100 to minus 100. set it up and just go for it. Thickness, I think uh, 0.025 might be good. Oh, actually defaulted the loops back. So I'm going to undo that. Maybe make this a little bit thicker. Turn the loops off. And I'll look at it. Oh, that's too much. I think uh, 0.045 would be better. There we go. Okay, so with only one loop and 0 0.045 for the, I mean, I could have gone with five and it would be a little bit thicker, but I wanted something a little bit thinner than 0 0.05. Uh, but either way, even if you didn't do it this way, you could probably do a Q mesh and just take the shape and push it inward or outward and get your shell. That also works. Uh, I just chose to do it this way because at least that way the thickness will be consistent, right? Um, but you can do some interesting things here. So like B, Z, 
You can take the Z modeler. You can push out polys. So like if I go ahead and select a bunch of faces here. Oops, those guys. Do this here. Do it like that, maybe. Uh, you know, Q mesh, single poly, quarter step, maybe. And you can pull these out. And if you looked at it with um, the dynamic subdiv, you can sort of see how your mesh will shape up, right? Um, kind of before you put any creasing to it, uh, or any type of reinforcement edge loops along the edges, um, but you can do that sort of thing. So from here, it becomes almost like you know if you were using Maya or anything like that, or another package like 3ds Max or what have you. You can use some of the modifiers and the uh, not only in the the new modifiers and the deformers. Uh, but you could also use a lot of the Z modeling tools uh, on these kinds of shapes and then pluck them out. So this is kind of basically in the vein of how some of those cowlings were made, right? And then it becomes a, a full-on part, a piece. I'll take and go back, actually. So just this piece. And say if I did this at a Q mesh single poly, I have some polys selected and I'm going to go an actual full step and if I just push this through it'll actually knock a nice little hole through that yeah and then of course I can zoom in here go on the edge and do some creasing uh, crease there uh, oops I think I have it set to just edge but you want edge loop complete and that way it'll go all around the object and clicking it once I'm not sure exactly how my edge loops are, are going perfectly around the edge. They should be pretty tight, but it put an edge loop, or not an edge loop, I'm sorry. Uh, it put a crease on both sides of the poly faces on the outside lip, right? So now if I look at it, all of these are going to be a little bit more sharper. And so you just strategically go around and um, place some of your creasing so that you can harden up your object. Uh, maybe you might have to move a few, you know, verts around, that sort of thing. But you could definitely use it plus clipping or something like that and shape it up and get it really nice uh, looking for a, a more consistent result. But that's pretty much how I built a lot, all of the cowlings, right? Uh, some of which, uh, after I contoured it, I just uh, decimated it. Uh, if you haven't noticed, uh, I'll just take this piece for an example. It's not the sharpest, but uh, in the Z plugin, you can later then just come uh, and use the Decimation Master. All right? And you might want to pre process current. And then, of course, these presets work like gold. So, like about 20,000 um, polys or 35,000k polys. Uh, is what you you know the decimated result would be especially if it's high res or something it'll knock it way down um, and then of course I can use that in other places um, even if it's sort of triangulated I can take that into another app and maybe use it as a prop um, but for the most part I just shelled them out so you remesh them and then recreated them so uh, if you look at a lot of these like this one here This one here is all decimated, right? Uh, so for sometimes when you put these into Keyshot, uh, different materials, especially if they have a curvature, will pick up the edge. So I would just be careful. Sometimes you might need to convert them over to Dynamesh to sort of smooth them out or relax the mesh after you convert it into Dynamesh or maybe Z remesh it. And that way it'll be a little bit smoother because all of these little small verts here will uh, get picked up in the maps of the curvature and it'll really kind of mess with it. <laughs> it'll look like faceting uh, in some cases. Very cool. All right, so we only have a few more minutes left, so let's get back to sculpting. Uh, I'll come back to this guy. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Cheers. So I'll take that. 
take and I'll put this last limb here. And we'll put our big old mech foot in there. So at least this way, uh, as I start to do layouts, every once in a while when I start sketching out and adding pieces using the IMM brushes, uh, I will routinely come in, in inside of the materials uh, and get that outline, or thin outline, I believe it was. Is it this one? Outline thin, yep. And if you go all the way black, it'll just give you the silhouette. So I could actually draw these out. Like if I was to use this for illustration, right? I could take this, hit T, come out of edit mode, draw another, hit T, turn it, right? And if I wanted to totally do a redesign, at least I have this this template uh, of the, the silhouette in black fill, and I can take this and I can use it to draw against, right? Um, same thing as if you were to add some outline to it, you could probably do a, ne a positive negative sort of um, thumbnail of these uh, and then just do a screen grab or something and take them into Photoshop and then separate it out uh, and then continue to do an illustration. So that's, that's sort of the power behind working from 2D to 3D and then back again. And, you know, they, they become sort of a universal tool so that you can flip and flop uh, and in a timely fashion kind of um, come to some surmised workflow where uh, you know you you have what you need you, you don't really have to say okay well I'm gonna stop have a coffee and draw on some paper for a while although that's excellent <laughs> but and then you could you know uh, sort of set things up um, for iterative design right so like if I wanted to change the stance of the legs uh, or add shapes and see what kind of shapes actually jive well with this uh, that's sort of like the, the idea behind doing something like this. Right. Uh, okay. So I'm going to hit Control N and do a new. And, uh, my balloon is turned off. Okay. That is still on. Go back to my material. Pick a different material, something a little softer. Uh, let's see if we can play with one of our other arm leg shapes. So that's actually a cool one. I like using this one a lot because um, it's a big shell piece, but I can then sort of draw. align that a little bit later using the gizmo. Uh, my shoe piece is different, but I need to actually do a split on it. There we go. So I will split mass points. So that way that piece is no longer part of the foot. And what's neat is, you know, if you create these for yourself uh, and you build a library, a sort of like visual library of everything that you have, um, you know, it, it's just like you doing your own drawing, you know, um, pretty much. I mean, you can do some really neat sketching uh, just right off of the bat without having to create new geometry. Um, I was kind of thinking that it would be cool for everyone is you're creating a your own hard surface designs and you're doing things kind of this way um, that I would create 
cowling pieces or shells uh, that are very basic in nature. So um, I didn't want to create too much surface noise. So some of these, they, they look really simple, like maybe one part only has like a little tiny detail on it. Um, that is because I wanted to give you guys sort of your own areas of rest. So I try to, sorry, Blind Fox, uh, I was gonna answer, I was gonna say something different, but I, I wanna answer your question really quick. Um, I haven't been because of just time constraints. Um, actually next month I may sort of uh, be off uh, working on a project um, that uh, I, I'm gonna have to pay attention to, so I'm not gonna uh, commit myself to regularly streaming too much, but uh, for the sake of um, my own channel, yeah, every once in a while, you know, I'll try to uh, come up with some content which I feel, you know, would be cool, and I can take longer than two hour sets uh, and just spend an afternoon streaming, and it gets really cool. Um, but yeah, it's been actually a minute because you know, usually when I'm working, I have my kids about, and it kind of gets a little bit hard to stream on a consistent basis. But sometimes, yeah, even late late at night, I will uh, come on to Twitch. Uh, and also Facebook. Sometimes I'll do Facebook lives a lot, so I'm around. <laughs> but um, something like this, yeah, you can you could totally come and sketch. So within just that few those few minutes, uh, I've come in here and sort of created a, a silhouette, right? Uh, with even a sort of a, a gesture, right? Uh, and then I could hand this off to a friend, and um, you know or the next uh, person in the pipeline and they can see, you know, okay, well, what if we make this movable and then they can rig it and we can see how the parts work together or if there are going to be any parts that are intersecting. Um, kind of like at this cowl here at the top, you'll see like parts are starting to run into each other. So at least I know what, what kind of areas that I need to edit. Oh, cheers. Thanks. Thanks, team. Or thanks this team. Appreciate it. But um, yeah, I mean, you can just come in and start doing some arrangements of your own, uh, and it'll be a lot of fun. And I'll move this guy up just a tad and rotate it. So that's going to be our, our ankle piece, and that would make a nice knee. But I might have to move some things around a little bit. Move that forward and back. So that basically becomes our knee. Uh, well, let's add a few more things. I'd have to actually cut this because the, that's actually one piece. Unless this knee piece is so high that it would be up here, which is totally possible. Uh, but I was also thinking, uh, take another shape that should be in here. Yes, this one. Uh, and I'll just, actually I'll draw this here. There we go. Uh, and then take this and use this as a kneecap. Um, and if I don't like this shape, I can actually test out a few other ones. Uh, like, for example, this guy was also designed to be a kneecap. Uh, or at least the taller part of one. Uh, BT. Go to my other set again. Maybe grab a shell like this. And that will be actually the knee plate assembly that I'll use. Split it. I don't think so. Actually, um, I hope not. For the music uh, that I'm playing in the low in the background, um, some every once in a while, if it's copyrighted material, then I think uh, probably it'll zap some of the sound. But I think that some of this stuff should be maintained. Uh, a lot of my explanations for for the inner workings of some of this stuff should be maintained. go. 
so that's cool. And then I just have to build out a block for here. We'll try to get something going for the back part of this. good and so now let's just try to look at it and see how it renders out so because I still have uh, the render on uh, for Keyshot the external render I can just click here oh see just ran into that that problem as I described I forgot to unpause Keyshot and there it goes easy fix so I'll just unclick this and turn it back on. I'll go back over here. Unpause this. And DPR it again. Oh, great. That's awesome. Yeah, Live Boolean is, is really, really handy. Um, just remember that before you try to send those booleans out anywhere, you actually need to make a union mesh. I have no idea. Actually, uh, <laughs> I have been listening to this DJ who put together this, uh, what is called a future garage mix. Uh, I guess it's an actual thing, but it's uh, like if you're into artists like Burial or Insomnia or... Uh, there's a lot of really cool bands that are coming out these days on uh, uh, Bandcamp. So like independent artists that are not signed with major labels, but they you can buy their their tracks. And they can buy and sell uh, online with a mobile app. It's kind of like one of those things. In fact, here, what I'll do is sort of separate to our conversation. I'll just link it in the chat. Okay, so in Keyshot, this guy should be in there. Go ask mom about it, please. I'm working here. Bye. Not right now, dude. Please. So I'm not sure what happened. Maybe my axis is off, but I think this is... I actually built this upside down. Sure. Bye. Uh, I actually need to fix this. I think somewhere along the floor might maybe I accidentally made it upside down or the floor is not coming through properly because you can see the ground shadows are on top. But it's in there for the moment. I need to probably just fix and snap the floor to the bottom of the, the mesh there. Um, let's take a look. Nope, nope. So I'll turn the floor on. One more time, I'll try to send it over and see if it fixes itself. Nope. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna do like this. Let's do a new one. And come back over here. Floor turned on. Yep. Should be okay. Do a BPR. And there we go. Yep. So one of the cool things about doing splits um, every time when you do this, uh, you can actually place different materials on the split um, uh, objects. So remember to split things up and just sort of make sure that they're grouped together uh, subtool-wise. That way, you know, each time 
a lot of these parts will be separated and you can expand it and actually pick various specific parts uh, and put materials to those. All right. So next time around, um, I will try to link you guys and happy sketching. Uh, I think my time is coming up on, on two hours now. But uh, thank you very much for joining me uh, this nice Saturday we have here. Um, stay tuned, guys. I'm not sure when I'm scheduled to stream again uh, here in the next maybe month. But uh, as soon as I can get back to things, we'll do more sketches and more sculpts. And um, I'll show you guys how to go either in between 2D and 3D and back again. And uh, yeah. Happy sculpting. All right, dudes. Thanks a lot. Have a good one. Happy Memorial Day. I'm out. Peace.